CityCast from Explicity. The men thought the fuss was only womanish frivolity. Fatigued because of the difficult nighttime inquiries, all they wanted was to get rid of the bother of this newcomer once and for all, all before the sun grew strong on that arid, windless day. They improvised a litter with the remains of foremasts and gaffs, tying it together with rigging so that it would bear the weight of the body until they reached the cliffs. They wanted to tie the anchor from a cargo ship to him so that he would sink easily into the deepest waves where fish are blind and divers die of nostalgia and bad currents would not bring him back to shore as had happened with other bodies. But the more they hurried, the more the women thought of ways to waste time. They walked about like startled hens, pecking with the sea charms on their breasts, some interfering on one side to put a scapular of the good wind on the drowned man, some on the other side to put a wrist compass on him. And after a great deal of getaway from there, woman, stay out of the way, look, you almost made me fall on top of the dead man, the men began to feel mistrust in their livers and started grumbling about why so many main altar decorations for a stranger. Because no matter how many nails and holy water jars he had on him, the sharks would chew him all the same. But the women kept piling on their junk relics, running back and forth, stumbling, while they released in size what they did not in tears. So that the men finally exploded with since when has there ever been such a fuss over a drifting corpse, a drowned nobody, a piece of cold Wednesday meat. In this episode, we spend quite a bit of time examining the comma. This, the smallest of literary squiggles, is also the most important of all squiggles. Now, not using a comma correctly could have serious implications. It could change the meaning of a sentence. It's quite one thing when that happens in daily life. Quite another in courts of law. A misplaced or missing comma could have serious legal implications. In 2006, a dispute in Canada over a comma in a 14-page long contract in a telecom case resulted in a cost of something like a million dollars. In another case, in the state of Maine in the U.S., delivery drivers of Oakhurst Dairy were in a legal spat with their employers for overtime. The U.S. Court of Appeals determined that Maine's overtime law was grammatically ambiguous, and for that reason, the drivers won the appeal. The sentence in question was this. The canning, processing, preserving, freezing, drying, marketing, storing, packing for shipment or distribution of whatever those products were. The rules of the Oxford comma, which which P and I will discuss in our segment, What's That Word, later in the show, state that there should have been a comma between the words shipment and or, like this, packing for shipment, comma, or distribution. The court ruled that the lack of a comma meant the phrase packing for shipment or distribution was one action rather than two distinct actions, and they decided the case on that basis. So, grammar is important in law, and if lawyers must be grammatical, then there is a very good chance that some of them will be literary. For the same reason, I suppose that many architects are also good designers. And proof of that is my guest today, Aditya Sondi, a senior advocate with a master's in political science and a PhD for a thesis he wrote on the army and democracy. He's an author of two books published by Penguin and an author of two one-act plays, one of which got shortlisted for a prestigious award. Who better than he with whom to discuss good grammar? So, raise the curtains and let the man on stage, Dr. Aditya Sondi. Aditya, it's great to have you on The Literary City. Thank you, Ramji. Good to be here. That passage you read, Marquez, wasn't it? That's right. What's it called? The Handsomest Drowned Man in the World. Handsomest Drowned Man. 
which is why I guess Marquez had his female characters fussing over a corpse. But then the story itself, such political allegory, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I mean, those words came back to me after 30 years and they still have the magic uh, of Marquez that uh, he always had. The allegory, of course, I've, I've never read Marquez for allegory. I mean, it's just his dreamy, uh, almost otherworldly style of writing that does it for me. Now, as a lawyer and a man of literature, as I pointed out in the monologue, is there a strong connection between the two? Yes and no. There's, of course, a, a strong discipline to the grammar of the law in terms of how you write and articulate and read it. No doubt about it. And there is also an interface in advocacy and literature in terms of making one's oral arguments more interesting, more uh, impressive, and possibly you know, more convincing. But that said, for me, the world of literature by itself is a respite from the law in the sense. I, I go to literature to look at good law, good life outside of the law. Uh, there's really no part of my brain that's telling me that this is going to tie back into my profession. If it does, well and good, yeah. And how do you make those oral arguments interesting? Well, I believe that's best done organically. And maybe that's where reading broadly helps because uh, I don't think you can orchestrate it. You will sometimes uh, on your feet arguing a case find that a metaphor or a phrase or a verse from a poem possibly could come in handy in that circumstance. It could uh, make a pithy point. It could even uh, bring a bit of humor sometimes. Banter, wit and repartee in courts of law are matters of legend. Also a romantic notion. <laughs> You're right. I mean, that's really what makes court uh, enjoyable and light at times. And things can get a bit, you know, uh, sharp sometimes with the pressure of cases and so on. And it is exactly this banter that, that uh, keeps things lighter. It's it's also a battle of wits sometimes. And if you have a quip that gets you ahead, then why not? So if you were the principal of a school of law, would you mandate that reading is a part of the main curriculum? Certainly. I mean, look, being well informed on subjects out of your immediate discipline, I think, is bread and butter for the law. Because the law is, in that sense, a very adaptable profession. So you're going to be dealing with issues from, say, biodiversity to cryptocurrency to uh, gender rights, right, in the course of a week, possibly. And in that sense, being broadly read definitely helps you bring in your own uh, knowledge. Of course, it's secondhand knowledge sometimes when it comes to specialized areas, but uh, it's important. It's important for you to read and understand the discipline that the case involves. So to that extent, of course, being broadly read uh, is a virtue. It's a virtue to everyone. But I certainly think it is uh, the case is for lawyers. Does it help you also bring in a little edge to your submission style per se? I don't know. I've never, never thought of that consciously. I think either you have that uh, or you don't. Um, if ideas or thoughts come to you impromptu, I believe those are the best. Let's talk grammar. Yeah. Punctuation. The humble comma. I mean, commas can create havoc in court, <clears throat> as they often have, uh, especially, uh, you know, in taxing statutes and so on, where you have classes of goods that need to be assessed to tax, and a comma can make a world of difference. That being the case, does or should law school focus a lot of its attention on grammar and punctuation? I mean, they do. Not that I remember too much of uh, discussion around a comma in law school, but that's my fault, perhaps. But we have a course on what you've called uh, statutory interpretation, which is an, a separate, uh, you know, subject by itself, which is of crucial importance in understanding how to interpret statutes. And, and in that sense, yes. But, you know, that teaching more than in law school, I think, should also happen in uh, parliament and in legislature, because that's where laws are drafted. Uh, interpreting it is the job of lawyers and courts, but getting it right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So when a government order is drafted or a rule is, is drafted or a statute or even a constitution is drafted, I think the onus is then on the drafts persons to make sure that if you're using a comma or you're using, uh, you know, a, a preface or you're using uh, and and or and so on, you've pretty much got to be sure 
why you were doing it. And if you see some of the older statutes and um, the older drafts of rules, you will find that there is great attention to detail. Almost nothing is left out. Everything belongs. That may not always be the case. And that's really where interpretation happens, uh, disputes happen, and then courts have to break their heads over Then, comments. as a lay person, I'm so happy that you guys haven't brought theater into it. I mean, imagine if you started taking pauses into account. <laughs> we are going to cycle forward to theater, but first, you're a published author, aren't you? Yes, I've published twice with Penguin. Uh, these were two books uh, dedicated to my old school, Cotton's. By Cotton's, you mean Where Bishop I... Cotton School in Bangalore. That's correct. Whose uh, Latin motto you picked up, I saw in one of your pieces. I found it yeah. fascinating. So these were books uh, around the alumni of the school, and they were written basically to in a sense of tribute. Uh, the second book came out on the sesquicentennial of the school. And I tried and look, look at 150 years of the history of the school through the lives of its alumni. A history of the city in, in a way. Now, you've also written two plays. And during the pandemic, you did several plays online. Am I correct? Well, I actually had a theater circle, uh, Ramji, which we did maybe we did maybe 15 or 16 readings over the last couple of years. Wow, that's quite the effort. Yeah. Do you have these really plays important. online somewhere? Oh, no, they're not. We kept them offline because the whole idea was to keep it slightly intimate. So pretty much till COVID kicked in, we used to do these readings in my living room. So you'd have sometimes 15, 20, 30 people even sitting around intimately listening to two or three readers. Sounds like fun. And yeah, post-COVID, post we moved it online, which I don't think was the same thing, to be honest. This was a group called Usher, named, named after, a, uh, well, I don't, I don't even remember how the name dropped. I think a theater in Edinburgh, if I'm not wrong. But yeah, that's, that's uh, what it was. So yeah, we did a bunch of readings over two years. And that led to me, during the first lockdown, deciding to sort of take the plunge and to try and write a short play, which is what I did. The play you wrote, uh, what was it called? Fama Gusta. You sent me the play. I read it. And honestly, I thought it was very well crafted. <laughs> Thank you. No, really, I liked it. So why don't we do, a, mm -hmm. why don't we stage that play on the literary city in one of the forthcoming episodes? Sure, would love to. And if yeah. you allow me to suggest, I think the female character should be my previous guest, Ruby Chakravarti. Oh, that would be fantastic. And I think she can pull off that particular role extremely mm. well. Oh, thank you for the lead then. I will certainly check in on her. Yeah, Ruby's good. Uh, who were your literary influences? Who moved the needle? I mean, different influences at different phases in my life, I'd say. And um, I mean, I've loved reading uh, Milan Kundera mm -hmm. more just for his style of writing. But in terms of uh, a slightly more visceral influence. I think my readings around caste have uh, influenced me very strongly. Specifically? I mean, very broad uh, writing on that, uh, Ramji. I mean, everyone, obviously from Ambedkar to Daya Pawar to, you know, more recent writing by uh, Sujata Gidla and many, many others. Del Tumbe. Uh, Del Tumbe. There are, there's a lot of new writing around caste. And I would say in the past few years, I found that uh, area of great interest. It's difficult reading. Uh, it's it's stuff that shows you a mirror. But I, I found that that was one area actually that overlapped with my understanding of the law, mm -hmm. especially constitutional law and right. uh, some some uh, lectures that I've done around reservation, around caste, etc. I found that my understanding of this very complex and very delicate area has been enhanced by reading on uh, on caste. But Perhaps in my younger days, uh, I know Shakespeare is a bit of a cliche, but mm -hmm. we studied two uh, tragedies of uh, Shakespeare in school, Julius Caesar and Macbeth. Okay. And um, I remember my English teacher, Mrs. Peacock, and what a fabulous teacher she was. Mm -hmm. She introduced us to the concept of Hamartia, which was, you know, the one fatal flaw right. in Shakespearean heroes or any heroes. Yes. And that got me reading a lot more around other Shakespearean tragedies, you know, Hamlet, King Lear, and Othello, and so on. And as a concept, I found that uh, fascinating. And the raging debate, are Hamartia and Hubris synonymous? Well, Hubris could be one form of Hamartia, I suppose. 
Uh, hubris could probably feed into, uh, you know, ego and flattery. Maybe the King Lear sort of Hamartia. But otherwise, I would think that Hamartia is a far broader uh, a sect in the sense that it's this inadvertent genetic or, you know, uh, uh, manufacturing defect in your soul, which uh, perhaps you're not oblivious to, or there's little you can do about it. I think that's where Shakespeare was coming from. The sort of uh, character flaw that you don't see or you don't want to see and which can really uh, be fatal at times. I think that that's where he was coming from. And to me, that's more than hubris. You have mentioned Milan Kundera, Gabriel Marquez, and Macbeth. And I'm going to throw in Kafka for good measure. Far greater on allegory, to my mind, than most other writers. Yeah. Now, I see a connecting thread mm -hmm. to each of these writers, you know, and I believe that connection is human frailty. Yeah, I mean, well spotted. I, I didn't make that connection in my mind. But now that you say it, it's, it's probably true. Why? <laughs> Why? Maybe that's my Hamarsha. <laughs> I have a thing for the, the complex and the, un, the uncertain. Maybe that's why. I don't know. Well, one man's Hamarsha and all that. <laughs> and now here's a question that I ask most literary people. The question is cliched. The answers seldom are. The question is, which literary character would you most like to have dinner with? My answer isn't. Uh, I would say Godo. <laughs> yeah, because then I'm pretty much going to be eating by myself. Um, he never comes, does he? <laughs> That's very funny. <laughs> I think Leaves you with the altar, doesn't he? He does. He always does. I mean, uh, the man is a nuisance. But uh, Beckett and Godo, gosh, I mean, look, that's a that's a different ball game. Right. My friend Pritam Koilpile, who you interviewed, I think, yes. on one of your earlier podcasts, yes. had something interesting to say, which was that when you read uh, Waiting for Godot, yeah. you read it aloud, I mean, not read it to yourself. You actually find a lyrical quality to it, mm -hmm. uh, which you don't when you read it to yourself. It just means so many things, and it means nothing at all at, all at once. So yeah, I would I would love to chat with Godo if he shows up. Will that be a table for one, sir? <laughs> and do you have a favorite literary quote? Oh, I mean, not too many, but I keep going back to uh, Lewis Carroll. The time has come. The walrus said, very sort of prophetic. And that's the uh, cabbages and kings one, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Ships and shoes and sealing wax. Cabbages and kings. Again, do you see the connection with Kafka and the rest of them? I can, I can begin to see that now, yeah. <laughs> we all have favorite opening lines. Which one's yours? The most memorable was the first line from, and I have the book uh, here with me, Salman Rashid's A Time of Madness, which is a memoir of partition. Salman uh, Rashid, very frequently confused with Salman Rushdie. But please, read the line. On the 20th day of March 2008, I headed home for the first time in my life. I was 56 years and a month old, unquote. And uh, to me, uh, as belonging to a partition family, um, I thought these lines were profoundly beautiful. I mean, I, to be honest with you, I was reading this in Koshi's and I just put the book down because, you know, I had a lump in my throat. And this was a chap who was, uh, you know, a converse partition, a family that had moved from uh, Jalandhar to... Uh, Pakistan, and he comes back to his native home when he's 56 years old. Hmm. And there's another line which uh, is not really an opening line from a book, but a line that stayed with me. Okay. Which is uh, what uh, Juan Rulfo, the Mexican writer, says. Please. Uh, he says, In my life, there are many silences. Uh -huh. And uh, this was something uh, I think he said in the context of his novel, Pedro Paramo. Now you must admit to the pattern. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm now caught on tape. I have no way out of it. Caught on tape. I was really uh, introduced to him through an in interview that Marquez had done. And I was amazed that he had such a profound influence on someone like Marquez. And reading him, I mean, God, he's a brooding and a, and a dark writer. But yeah, there are these lines that he has uh, in his books. And I think in, in things he has to say himself, which uh, and stayed with me. Maybe that stuff is the antichrist to your normally sunny disposition. 
Possibly, possibly. And the rule four line that you just quoted. Is in my life, there are many silences. So when, not if, you become a judge, I hope that your autobiography will not be titled, In my life, there were many sentences. <laughs> well, I'm not becoming a judge. That possibly eliminates the possibility of an autobiography. Well, we'll postpone that sentencing and see what transpires. <laughs> and with that, Aditya Sondi, it was a complete pleasure to have you on The Literary City. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much for having me, Ramji. I thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. Likewise. At the end of this episode, we have Aditya Sondi reading the balance of that Marquez passage. But now, it's time for that fun, popular segment, What's That Word? where we look at phrases and words that we use all the time, but never stop to think about where they came from. And to help me with that segment is my co-host. And as always, I will let her introduce herself. Go right ahead. Hi, I'm Pranati. But you can call me P. That's P with an A, not another E. P with an A and not another E. Do you know what one would call your obsessed secret admirer? Hey, I'm not admitting to any secret admirer, <laughs> but I am curious. What would you call him? A peanut. <laughs> yeah, I suppose one would have to be a nut to secretly admire me. Oh, that is very, very modest. But now <laughs> that I'm past my one allowed dad joke... Let's move on. <laughs> okay, P with an A, what's the word? Yeah, so in your monologue and when you were talking to Aditya Sondi, mm -hmm. you guys spent a lot of time on the comma. Yes, very important little squiggle. Right, and you might say it gave me pause to bring it up today. Oh, okay, <laughs> fine. All right, you're also allowed one dad joke. Very, very <laughs> funny. All right, so you want to talk about the comma today? Yeah, but not just any comma, specifically mm -hmm. the Oxford comma. Ah, uh, that's my favorite type of comma. All right, sure, shoot. Yeah, so first, mm -hmm. why don't we define what is an Oxford comma? All right, go ahead, define away. Okay, sure. The Oxford comma is the final comma that, um, you know, comes before the conjunction in a list of so three or more items. Would you say that in English? <laughs> yeah, well, in school, you know how we were taught that there is no need for a comma before the and, right? Yeah. Yeah, so because the and comes before the last word in a list, and right. so there's no need for a comma. I remember that. Yeah, but the Oxford comma rules that there should be a comma. Mm. Is this not confusing? Yeah, all right. Let's have an example of a sentence where an Oxford comma is not required. Um, yeah, I mean, that's uh, sort of like uh, throw out the baby, comma, the bathwater, comma, and the kitchen sink. So in this sentence, there's really no need for a final comma, is there? That's very deft. You mixed your metaphors and you gave me an example. <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right. In a sentence... Throughout the baby, the bathwater, and the kitchen sink, uh, an Oxford comma might not be required. Yeah, you're right. There's no need of putting a comma before the last and. But not, yeah. but not all sentences are like that. Okay, so give me an example of a sentence where the Oxford comma is necessary. Okay, um, let me think. Yeah, here goes. I went for a walk with my dogs, grandpa and grandma. Uh, I don't get it. <laughs> right. I'll, I'll say it with the punctuation. I went for a walk with my dogs, comma, grandpa, comma, and grandma. Now, if I didn't have the last comma before the and, it would read, I went for a walk with my dogs, grandpa and grandma, which means the names of my dogs are grandpa and grandma. grandpa and grandma. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. You know, yeah. it's like, you may, I'll say the same sentence. Like, for example, if I didn't have the Oxford comma, I might be saying, I went for a walk with my dogs, Spot and Fido. Yeah, and then right. you wouldn't really need it. Got yeah. it. But if I put an Oxford comma in there, that would change the meaning. So you see, an Oxford comma is required. Let me give you a. Yeah. Uh, let me give you another example. I love my parents, Hillary Clinton and Santa Claus. <laughs> oh, why not? Okay. Well, 
how can you write this without an Oxford comma and not be embarrassed? Yeah, that's a good question, actually. You know, you know, how can we reconstruct that sentence? The sentence was, I love my parents, Hillary Clinton and Santa Claus, and you don't want <laughs> to use an Oxford comma. But yeah. if, I, if I wanted to rewrite this without having to use an Oxford comma, I would say, um, I love Santa Claus, Hillary Clinton and my parents. Mm, I see, get it. No need, yeah. no need for a for an Oxford comma. Yeah, but I'm betting you have another hilarious example lined up. <laughs> yeah, you know me. Okay, <laughs> yes, a rather unfortunate consequence of uh, a Sky News headline. Okay, let's hear it. This rather misleading headline read: "World leaders at Mandela tribute, Obama Castro handshake and same sex marriage date set." <laughs> Well, congratulations, Mr. Obama and Mr. Castro, I guess. Well, you know, the Raul <laughs> Barak nuptials, what can I tell you? <laughs> it's very, very woke. Woke, like they woke the next morning and realized what they've done. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, but let's get to the etymology. Where did it all start? Okay, let me start with the Oxford comma. The Oxford comma has been attributed to Horace Hart, this guy, he was a printer in the Oxford University Press, and he was mm -hmm. a printer, uh, it is said, from 1893 to 1915, during which time in 1905, he wrote this tome called Hearts Rules for Compositors and Readers. You know, compositors are the guys that used to assemble you know, the, the typefaces, you know, letter by letter by letter. You know, those, those are called compositors. Right. So he had that book. Now, he used the comma and told people that he had they had to use the comma before the last item in a list. Right. Now, nobody called it the Oxford comma until many years afterwards, when this guy called Peter Sutcliffe, mm. he, um, he wrote a book in 1978 about the history of the, of the Oxford University Press, in which he referred to this practice as the Oxford comma, right? Uh -huh. But the modern version of the comma itself comes from an Italian, a 15th century Italian printer called Aldo Manuzio. And he introduced the comma as we know it as a way to separate things. Yeah. You said um, the modern version. So now right. I take it you're going to bring ancient Greece into it somehow? <laughs> I always love to bring ancient Greece into it. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> it's true. Well, the word comma comes from the Greek word. Uh, it says captain, uh, which means to cut off. See, I knew it. <laughs> right. Anyway, this practice of, of that word, it was invented in the third century BC by Aristophanes. And Aristophanes used that along with a different system. You know, he had a system of, of using dots to define pauses in speech. So when you wrote stuff, you would put dots in there to mm. show a break in the speech. And right. So in the time of Aristophanes, the comma used to be a diagonal slash known as the virgula suspensiva. Oh, that old um, virgula suspensiva trick. <laughs> yes, that what? is true, that trick. What is the virgula suspensiva? Well, I can't answer that question directly, but let me actually tell you about how it came to being. Now, the mm -hmm. comma has gone through more stages of branding than a hotel each time they tie up with another chain. <laughs> All right, but do you know what the comma was first called? No, what? The comma. <laughs> well, that clears everything up. But actually, that's quite fascinating that it didn't have much change over time. So tell me more. It had a lot of change over time. And let me explain that. So it started with it being called the comma. And then then people not satisfied with leaving it as the comma, they called it the subdistinctio, all right? Okay. And, and then by the 12th century, uh, even before they started handing out MBAs at street corners, <laughs> they, they rebranded it and called it the Virgula Suspensiva. Okay. Right? So that's how it came to be called. So first comma, then subdistinctio, and even that was not enough for people. They wanted to make it more important. So they called it the virgula suspensiva. And hmm. then, 
by the 16th century, a mere 400 years after, someone had this great idea, you know, in a meeting of grammarians, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. Hey, guys, she said, let's call this burgula suspensiva thing, let's call it a... Comma. Comma. You're right. Yeah. Back the full circle. Yeah. But we don't know why the literary or the grammarian word is so divided on the Oxford comma, do we? Or any comma. Mm, Right. Yeah. Why? I can't understand it myself. I can only guess it is to simplify things and make grammar easier. But, you know, I'm a staunch fan of the comma and comma... I'm sticking to it. (laughs) But uh, as Aditya Sondi also explained, it could have legal implications. Yes, it could. And social implications. Social implications like? Well, this one's kind of naughty, but my favorite defense of the comma is the sentence. There is a difference between helping your Uncle Jack off a horse. (laughs) Well, that's not (laughs) you to ride off into the sunset. Bye, cowgirl. (laughs) <laughs> all right p with an a thanks so much for being here that was fun and as always let's do it next week bye if you have a phrase that interests you confounds you or confuses you share it with us and we would love to be able to discuss it with you live on the show. Just write to us. You'll find out how in the podcast description. And if we like what you're sending us, we'll call you. Please take a moment to consider the number of children who would love to get an education but can't afford it. But on the good side, there are many institutions that run schools for free and they're doing a wonderful job. One such is the Association for People with Disabilities and they run a brilliant school for children. They could use your help. So if you went down to apd-india.org, you'll find out how you can help. Now, we have said this before, and we'd like to send heartfelt thanks on behalf of all the children at the APD school for all those who have reached out and helped. You can too. Teach a child to fish. And before we take you back to our feature with Aditya Sondi, Join our Facebook group. It's called Bangalore Literary Society. And we promise you there's a lot of good, fun stuff that's coming your way. And we just don't want you to miss it. All right. That's our show for today. Thank you so much for being there. This was such fun. And in closing, Dr. Aditya Sondi, reading from Marquez. One of the women mortified by so much lack of care, then removed the handkerchief from the dead man's face and the men were left breathless too. He was Esteban. It was not necessary to repeat it for them to recognize him. If they had been told Sir Walter Rayleigh, even they might have been impressed with his gringo accent, the macaw on his shoulder, this cannibal killing blunderbuss, But there could only be one Esteban in the world. And there he was, stretched out like a sperm whale, shoeless, wearing the pants of an undersized child, and with those stony nails that had to be cut with a knife. They only had to take the handkerchief off his face to see that he was ashamed, that it was not his fault, that he was so big or so heavy or so handsome. And if he had known that this was going to happen, He would have looked for a more discreet place to drown in seriously. I even would have tied the anchor of a galleon around my neck and staggered off a cliff like someone who doesn't like things in order not to be upsetting people now with this Wednesday dead body, as you people say, in order not to be bothering anyone with this filthy piece of cold meat that doesn't have anything to do with me. There was so much truth in his manner that even the most mistrustful men, the ones who felt the bitterness of endless nights at sea, fearing that their women would tire of dreaming about them and begin to dream of drowned men, even they and others who were harder still shuddered in the marrow of their bones at Esteban's sincerity. 
That was how they came to hold the most splendid funeral they could ever conceive of for an abandoned, drowned man. Thank you.